practical operation, operation sessions. So this session is focusing on uh, technical, operational, and practical things based on their own uh, experiences. So today, as you see, we have three speakers. Uh, here is Masataka from JPIX, which is one of the biggest IXs in Japan. Uh, he'll be speaking about the reason uh, why some of us are reluctant to deploy IPv6. So it must be interesting. Uh, second is Takejiro uh, with JPIX as well. So he will be talking about his own experiences to deploy 100 giga to the JPIX. And the last is Sandra. Uh, she will be talking about the IPv4 transfer, mar transfer market. So if you guys are ready, so let's get started. So first is Masataka. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Mastaka Mawatari uh, from JPIX. Uh, thank you uh, our opportunity to present here. Uh, I'd like to uh, talking about uh, IVP6 session and survey report. Uh, this is uh, a general session. Uh, it held uh, January uh, 2014. Uh, here is an uh, agenda, uh, introduction, background, and present situation in IPP6, uh, session summary and survey in Jan 35, uh, conclusion. Uh, let's uh, start with uh, Jan 35 uh, introduction. Uh, as you may know, uh, Janog uh, is uh, Japan Network Operators Group. Uh, the uh, last uh, meeting uh, was held for uh, three days in uh, January uh, at the uh, University of Shizuoka uh, in Shizuoka, uh, hosted by uh, Fujinokuni Information Network Organization. Uh, it had a variety of programs uh, and uh, both uh, tutorial. Uh, it includes uh, uh, routing session, uh, IPv6, uh, DNS, uh, BGP flow spec, and uh, emerging technology uh, and uh, emerging uh, service, uh, MVNO uh, OpenStack. Uh, uh, here is uh, introduction of this uh, presentation. Uh, uh, as I uh, talked in last slide, uh, Jan 35 uh, in Shizuoka. Uh, it had uh, one obsession, uh, why are we reluctant to deploy IPv6? Uh, this is our IPv6 session. Uh, further uh, deployment of IPv6 uh, on especially uh, content side uh, was uh, discussed. And uh, we also uh, carried out uh, a, a survey to service providers uh, for uh, further IPv6 uh, deployment discussion uh, to some uh, NOGS mailing list. Uh, for example, uh, APOPS, uh, NANOG, uh, and uh, IPv6 working group, uh, LIFE NCC. Uh, so uh, today, uh, I'd like to share uh, the session summary uh, in January 35 and uh, survey result uh, before uh, that session. Uh, <coughs> let us move to uh, next agenda, uh, background and the present situation in IPv6. Uh, here is uh, Chasm diagram. Uh, that tells uh, us uh, if uh, the adoption rate crossed 60% uh, 
the new technology or new product uh, will be common uh, in an increased uh, rate. Uh, but uh, I don't know whether uh, IPv6 uh, is new or not. Uh, but uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, Charles, uh, doesn't apply to IPv6 also? And uh, do you feel IPv6 becomes uh, widely prevalent? And um, I think uh, we have considerations of uh, IPv6 uh, development. Uh, uh, actually, uh, after a World IPv6 launch event, uh, there are some remarkable IPv6 deployment on the access side. Uh, as you see uh, in this slide, uh, Comcast is 35%, uh, ATT 38%, uh, uh, and KDDI 80%. Uh, uh, actually, uh, Top uh, 25 uh, ranking, uh, there are some Japanese ISPs, uh, KDDI, uh, Tube Telecommunications, uh, SoftBank BB, and uh, STNet. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, on the uh, content side, very little IPv6 has been deployed uh, outside of the uh, hypergiant. Uh, yeah, uh, IPv6 prevailing means that IPv6 packets actually transact uh, between servers and uh, clients all over the internet. Uh, therefore, presentation isn't good enough uh, need to discuss why we are reluctant to deploy IPv6, especially uh, content side. Uh, let me uh, back to the uh, fundamental uh, matter. Uh, this is uh, endpoints and uh, link uh, diagram. Uh, the uh, link uh, has to equip of protocols that can be selected from uh, each endpoint. And uh, two uh, endpoints, uh, Servers and the client. Uh, server endpoint uh, uh, is proactive in enabling the protocols by the uh, operators uh, in uh, service provider. Uh, and client side uh, isn't proactive in enabling uh, by end users uh, because end users uh, don't know what protocol uh, is. It depends uh, on uh, providers. Uh, for communication between uh, each endpoint uh, has to enable common protocols. At the uh, sort of IPv6, IPv4, uh, the link uh, is supported IPv6 and IPv4 uh, for selectability. Uh, at least uh, on ISPs uh, on the list uh, of uh, World IPv6 launch uh, measurement page. And uh, server uh, endpoint uh, have uh, IPv4 uh, only, actually. And uh, client side uh, may have IPv6 uh, and IPv4. Uh, it depends on the uh, internet access service of uh, internet service uh, provider. Uh, finally, uh, this uh, communication uh, select uh, IPv4, uh, not uh, IPv6. And uh, this is uh, today's uh, status of IPv6, IPv4. Uh, next, uh, session summary and survey in January 35. Uh, firstly, uh, let me introduce uh, speakers in IPv6 session of January 35 meeting. Uh, Ken Sasaki uh, belongs to uh, DMM.com Labo, uh, which is a content provider that pro uh, provides uh, video streaming, online game, uh, rental DVD, CD, and 
Takeshi Seki belongs to uh, Doango, uh, is a major content provider, uh, providing uh, video streaming uh, as known as uh, Nico Nico video, uh, music streaming, uh, online game. And uh, Masatoshi Yokota uh, belongs to Sakura Internet, uh, which is uh, one of major uh, cloud and server hosting provider. And uh, in, in that uh, session in Jan 35, uh, from content provider's point of view, uh, actual status is the uh, companies which the speakers work for uh, already have IPv6 address book, uh, which is allocated uh, by internet registry. Uh, but uh, in their companies, uh, service or application is not yet uh, deployed for IPv6 uh, in their company. Uh, actually, they have uh, some concerns. Uh, doubling of costs on IPv6 and IPv4 and uh, purpose of their business uh, in content provider is just daylight content, uh, not uh, IPv6 uh, service uh, as a transport. And uh, from content uh, cloud providers' uh, point of view, uh, they also have uh, already IPv6 address uh, block, and uh, the uh, uh, cl cloud uh, company, uh, Sakura Internet, provides IPv6 on all services. Uh, but uh, they uh, have uh, concerns. Uh, customer uh, purposely deceives IPv6 on hosting server service. Uh, actually, uh, it's service uh, enabling uh, by default, uh, but uh, their customer don't need uh, IPv6. Uh, here is a session summary uh, in January 35. Unfortunately, uh, most content providers in Japan uh, don't work on the uh, IPv6 uh, service now. And uh, most cloud server hosting providers offer uh, IPv6, uh, but uh, customers don't enable IPv6. Uh, eventually, uh, IPv6 uh, is necessary for global and uh, sustainable uh, viable ecosystem uh, cycle of the uh, internet. Uh, Especially uh, small uh, ISP, uh, regional ISP, or uh, emerging country uh, ISP uh, 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 deploying and uh, operating uh, carrier grade NAT uh, is uh, high cost uh, for them. Uh, but uh, it takes a long time to grow on IPv6. And, and next, uh, let me uh, introduce a survey result uh, before discussion uh, at IPv6 session in Janox 35. Uh, we had uh, eight uh, questions. Uh, if uh, I had a long time, uh, let me uh, introduce uh, all questions uh, and uh, answers. Uh, but uh, my uh, presentation, uh, uh, I uh, introduce uh, interesting uh, questions and uh, answers uh, for this time. Uh, this is uh, question eight. What are the conditions where IPv6 becomes widely prevalent? Uh, this is a uh, uh, main uh, answer uh, for this question. Uh, most of the uh, question is answered uh, that uh, when we use IPv6 only or when we don't uh, need IPv4. Uh, 
part of the uh, rest of them uh, answered that uh, IPv6 prevalence uh, is now in progress. Uh, but uh, let's see the bottom of, bottom of this slide. Uh, it is uh, same with what I would like to uh, tell you. Uh, where actually the endpoints communicate through IPv6. It's not just to offer IPv6 on the uh, access side. Uh, this uh, answer uh, is uh, what I'd like to uh, emphasize that uh, in this session. Uh, uh, we, uh, we, uh, what uh, do we do uh, the next uh, for deploying IPv6? Uh, last agenda, uh, let me uh, conclude uh, for this session. Uh, firstly, uh, let me introduce you uh, Montevideo statement. Uh, as you may know, uh, Montevideo uh, statement was signed by IAB, ICANN, ITF, ISOC, uh, W3C, and uh, five RIRs. Uh, this statement includes uh, IPv6, uh, IPv4 uh, deployment of uh, content site. Uh, the fourth statement, uh, they also called for the transition to IPv6 to remain a top priority globally. In particular, Internet content providers must serve content with both IPv4 and IPv6 service in order to be free and reachable on the global uh, internet. Uh, the last slide uh, for uh, my uh, presentation. Uh, I had uh, two points. Uh, Point one is the phasing of IPv6 deployment takes a long time and needs continued activity and approach uh, never stop. Point two is the, the content service must be served by both IPv6 and IPv4 because it doesn't discourage ISPs from introducing IPv6 to their access service. Uh, thank you for uh, your attention. So thank you, Ramatari Sam. Well, is there any comments, questions, or objections, agreements? So if you have something, please come to the microphone. Actually, he posted the survey and asked to a uh, bunch of network operators group, not only JANAG, but also a bunch of foreign NOGs. So actually today, uh, what he today so he shared uh, what he got from the survey so my question is what country from what country did you get answers uh, around 100 people uh, from overseas uh, okay, so. so in one what country do you remember Okay, it's a bunch of countries. So if you guys don't have anything, so can uh, we? I have a question. When you did the survey, did you look at any quality parameters of IPv6? Um, whether whether uh, the transactions that, that uh, convert four to six or six to four have any quality differential between straight IPv4? Uh, actually, uh, in the survey, uh, especially uh, IPv6, IPv4 uh, uh, translation technology, uh, the uh, question is, uh, uh, tells me uh, in 
their survey, uh, they deployed uh, native ITG to study. And anything about how well it works compared to IPv4? Thank you so much, Mama Teresa. So please give a hand to him. <laughs> so the next is Takeshi Rosan with JPIX about the 100 gig service of JPIX. Good morning. Uh, my name is Takejiro Takabayashi, and I'm with uh, JPIX, Japan Internet Exchange. And uh, I guess most of you know what the uh, Internet Exchange is. Is there anyone who does not know what the uh, Internet Exchange is? Okay, good. <laughs> so I'll, I'll just keep the uh, introduction about the Internet Exchange. So. Today, I'm going to uh, speak about the 100 gigabit Ethernet service as service. I mean, um, 100 gigabit Ethernet as has been uh, standardized with uh, 802.3 BA on 2010, July. And now it's 2015, and it's been uh, five years or maybe or more. We started thinking about the uh, uh, using 100 gigabit Ethernet from 2009, which was uh, still a high, higher study group, higher speed study group, and um, it, it's been six years already, and we took five years to deploy 100 gigabit Ethernet. What was that, uh, it, it wasn't the problem, it, it was just the timing of the, uh, I don't know, the, I don't know, so I'm doing this presentation, okay? <laughs> so what was our motivation, or what motivate our uh, deployment of 100 gig? Was that, uh, I'll just say conclusion was our customer requirement. First, we thought when it was 2009, we thought it was because of the traffic, but it wasn't, I mean, it, it should be, I mean, I hope so, but no. It was the customer requirement, and sure, the traffic. Traffic is another important aspect of the having 100 gigabit Ethernet. And the new technology, like uh, it's being 100 meg, 1 gig, 10 gig, and 100 gig, and all the technologies, new technologies are coming up, so uh, you like new technologies, so I, I, I like it too. And cost. Cost is another aspect, so uh, new interface comes out, it always have a uh, uh, risk to have, um, I'm not coming up with uh, English, but uh, and um, let's look into Europe. The, IX point traffics are growing, as hopefully you know it. And uh, in Europe, it's a very, very uh, tremendous, enormous uh, volume of, of traffic is has been uh, exchanged within the internet exchange. I put this uh, three of the uh, major IX in the uh, world or Europe. Um, the top one is the M6, and the second uh, green one, I'm not green, the yellow one is the uh, D-Kix from uh, Germany, and uh, the bottom one is the Lynx. And I couldn't put 
on the net node, but they also have uh, terabytes of the traffic. So they're pretty much, um, their IX culture is very, very uh, interesting. I mean, wonderful. They're peers, they're uh, friends each other. So they peer a lot. And 100 gigabit Ethernet in um, Europe, it's no surprise. So M6 has been started their service since 2010. And uh, DKIX has completed their service with using the Alcatel uh, switches with name by Apollon. And also uh, Lynx has their Juniper equipment with uh, 2012. And I, I think they already have it with uh, Extreme Land too. So all the, okay, net not again. They also have 100 gig. <laughs> <Got this. coughs> and let's look into Asia. Um, Asia. Um, Hong Kong IX has already uh, 400 gigabit per sec uh, of the peak. And they also have uh, their 100 GB service available. And JPNAP, uh, it's not aggregated traffic. So it, it, if it's in aggregated, they have a couple sites. So it should be 500 gig over. But I just put the Tokyo One site uh, traffic stats in. It still has 400 gigabit e Ethernet within the Tokyo Metro only, and they also have 100 gig available. And they've started their service since 2012, I mean 100 gig service in 2012. And look into my uh, company, JPIX. Our traffic has a uh, maximum peak of 300 gig around uh, average, not average, sorry, the peak is the uh, 300 gig. And uh, many of the contents customers in, um, I don't know, the video streaming and all those uh, data stuffs are going on. So it's increasing very uh, dramatic. And from 2000 to 2000, um, I mean, 2007 to 2009, the traffic uh, volume exploded really uh, Big. And by that time, we were expecting uh, the traffic should grow uh, exponentially, but uh, it was much more flatter than we thought. So um, the traffic itself was in, the, in problem. But uh, last year, uh, from 2013 to 2014, uh, no, no, it's 2014 to 2015, the year of 2014, we have the growth rate of 143, uh, 1.43. So, which means uh, it almost doubled from 2007. So, we're pretty much, uh, now was the time with traffic. And finally, we had this 100 gig service for uh, available to members. And it was 2014 of um, whatever, July. And we used the blockade and um, um, our customer member named uh, Dowango, which has the very famous video streaming content in Japan, Niko Niko Doga. And they have started uh, using 100 gi as service with us. Thank you. And <coughs> what makes us think about Deploying 100 gig, what, well, what is the good side about uh, 100 gigabit ethernet? It's the speed is faster, um, faster is better, I guess. And uh, less operation, so uh, we had to bundle um, like more than eight uh, 10 gigabit ethernet on the one of the switch interlink and well, in that case, there's many uh, configuration has to make. I mean, it's, it's, it's very simple. Link aggregation works, but uh, there's much more strands uh, you need. And it, 
there's, uh, if there's fiber, uh, you can have trouble with that fiber if, you know. So less consideration, less, less operation, less consideration is a good thing about 100 gig and uh, opens up your opportunity. It's a couple of the content providers or those people who has the uh, lot of traffic has been already had uh, bundled a couple of uh, 10 gigs. So uh, they may want it to have 100 gig instead of having the another 10 gig uh, added to, they, they don't also want to have, uh, want to think about go, uh, you know, uh, having the another tangi, but instead of having another tangi, they would have a uh, hundred gi available. So we could uh, open up opportunity for those kind of uh, uh, members. And on the other hand, the negative side of hundred gi is that uh, we have to have uh, reliability or stability on this interface. Uh, hundred if. 100 gi goes down, uh, it's a nightmare. You don't want to think about it. Uh, it's too fast. If you go fast and you know you trip or something, you get hurt really bad. <laughs> so I don't want to have that kind of the experience, and um, I, which I haven't yet. And we needed the experience too. So. Uh, we worked with the test set and all those stuff uh, that we can uh, work around before uh, 100 gb we uh, provided as service. And we had a lot of time for experience, so we have confident about it. And cost, um, cost for capital, capex, and operation cost may go higher. It, most of the part, it was the uh, CapEx, but uh, yes, uh, it is higher. And opportunity loss, um, it's what I was saying about the uh, content providers that they would have uh, become a member if we have this 100 gig Ethernet available. And if we don't, we may lose that customer. So issues for deploying the 100 gig service, and it's about, uh, like I said, we have been uh, working around with 100 gig uh, since 2009, and it was a long project. I mean, it should be just like this, but it took us five years. So what we have done before we uh, uh, start 100 gig as service was uh, we needed to upgrade our IX architecture. And I'll go with one by one uh, from next slide, so I'll just skip a couple of them. And verifying the 100 gig interface. So we have this optical switch, and we had to test with that too. And selection of the optical interface and optical module. As you know, there's a whole bunch of uh, modules coming out. And 100 gig Ethernet tester. That's that has uh, a lot of features that you can uh, have fun. So uh, upgrading the IX architecture. We used to use the uh, equipment, uh, the Dell Force Nan E1200i, and we knew that they would not gonna be supporting the 100 gig interface no more. So we had to shift to something else and at the time, uh, when it was like 2009 or 2010, the MLXE was the only option. So uh, not a, nowadays, there's a whole bunch, but at the time, it was the uh, only choice. So we choose to have this MLXE 16 on the middle. Not the middle, but uh, it used to be not middle. And we changed our structure a lot because uh, we had to have uh, uh, middle sized chassis uh, around my switches, but we shifted to the uh, big chassis in the middle and uh, having leaf switches. Uh, leaf switches. And verifying the 100 gig interface. So we have this uh, optical switch system. 
uh, it's from the MTT80 version of it, and you can see the actual switch. Uh, it's not different from what we are using, but uh, you can see it at the fifth floor uh, in front of the escalator next to JPNAP uh, booth. So you can check it out. And uh, it's what it does is it's just the physical, mechanical, uh, AV type of a switching. Your router has here, and it just switches over from active to standby. So if the our active switch goes down with the light goes down, it just switches over the uh, from active to standby within three milliseconds. So if your router setting or our switch setting, I mean not our switch setting, but the, your router uh, switch setting had good. Uh, time timer of delay, like 60 millisecond or something, then it will just, uh, your BGP won't get frapped, so you won't see nothing. I mean, there's still a couple of uh, packet loss are there, but uh, you won't see uh, BGP goes down, so we choose to have uh, this switch, optical switch, and we, once uh, if we go to 100 gi, I have to test this 100 uh, optical switch with uh, 100 gi interface. So we test it with uh, 100 gi base LR4, ER4, SR10, and um, it all just worked. But uh, SR10 uh, uses too much fiber, so we're just not using that. But uh, everything works with optical switch, so it just works. And optical, optics and optical modules. So at the time, it was, there was only option with CFPs. So sh there's CFP with LR4, there's CFP with CR4, there's CFP with SR10, and all the CFPs available. And also 10 by 10 MSA. And it has two kilometer and 10 kilometers. And optical uh, module, CFP, CFP2, CFP2, 4, uh, CPAC, QSFP28, uh, whatever. Um, a lot of the modules to uh, uh, check. And 100 gig Ethernet tester. Uh, particularly, we what we do with uh, 100 gig Ethernet tester is that uh, we just do the RFC 2544 uh, throughput test. So uh, it's not about uh, um, convinced customers that our, our switch is working with 100 gig with fine rate. And it's, it's not about the protocols, it's just uh, throughput testing. And also I, what I like about TestSet is that uh, TestSet can show you that those uh, PCS errors or bit bait errors or whatever, the error that cannot be shown on the switches, but that that's just uh, within the CFP. So I, I'm not. It's good to uh, use it to learn about hundred gig uh, protocols, but uh, yeah, it's 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 that much. But one thing that it's useful when after we uh, goes into service is that it can be used as the CFP health checker. So uh, vendors, uh, I put the X4 uh, from Canada's uh, test set picture on it, but uh, they allow us to use our own CFP, so we should just choose their uh, test set to check our uh, CFPs and also this is handheld type, so if there's problem within the uh, customer premises, we can bring it to the customer premises and check their CFP too. And uh, technology myths and truths. So um, at the time, um, 10 by 10 MSA was, uh, I, I was told that 10 by 10 SM MSA was uh, affordable and it still, uh, it really works fine because it's using the old technology and stuff. But um, nowadays, I, 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 I don't see 
in my DMSA anymore. The vendor is all gone, Sunter, uh, Nail Photonics. The vendors who made those uh, DMI DMSAs are gone because uh, four lanes uh, are the uh, structure of the 802.3BA. So it's not gonna be available with CFP2 or CFP4 or QSFE24, I mean 28. So we have to uh, think about those kind of uh, uh, technology changes too, so. And a big chassis that supports 100 gig can be in the middle. Uh, in our case, um, we're using brocade and uh, first of all, it's not gonna work because the 100 gig and one gig interface cards are different module and it, the SFM won't gonna uh, let us work. I mean, let us use it. And also you have to think about buffers too, so I don't wanna put the 101 gig in the same situation. And uh, sure, the vendor lock-ins as always, uh, CFPs and 100 gig modules are very expensive. Uh, if I wanna go to Alcatel, then I can't use whatever I have right now. So I don't want those kind of uh, uh, lock-in or restriction. And timing, uh, it, it always, I ask myself that if we, you know, if we wait for another year, there's gonna be much, much better products that are coming out. We know that and everybody knows it. And the cost miss and uh, truth. Um, so 100 gig is getting less expensive. Uh, yes, it has. Um, comparing from the 2012 and now, it's, uh, I don't know, half the price. Yes, if, when I get quoted, yes, it was half a price. But in, at this moment, 2015, it's still 21 times higher. You can buy 21 uh, 10 gigabit Ethernet optics with 100 gig uh, compared to uh, one GFB with LR4 module. So that's 21 equals one GFB. So I, I, uh, I don't know, it, it's your choice, but uh, is it really expensive or not? So again and again, I thank uh, myself that is it time to buy or go for uh, 100 gig or should I wait? Uh, it's vicious circles never ends. It always having my question while I sleep. Okay. So summary, um, I, I don't mean that don't deploy or any negative. I, I wanna be more positive about it. So, uh, 100 gig Ethernet is still ongoing technology and there's a lot of indecisiveness. You, you have to uh, worry about, you know, when you deploy 100 gig or you buy the products from the vendors, but um, um, most of the traffic generators, the content providers, IX people like r and e people from APAN or those people are start using it and it's been already uh, deployed for, I don't know, more than five years now. So it just works fine and I did it and why don't you do it? Or if you lose the timing, it's gonna be get really hard because you know if your boss can have that kind of a budget, just let them say yes, okay? All right, that's about it. Uh, any comment or questions? So if you have any comments, questions, please come to the microphone. Well, actually I have one, not question, but comment. Um, I've been working for an ISP for this couple of years. So we've been deploying 100 gig Ethernet into our backbone as well. 
So, you know, like my, you might have said, so how fast or when we deploy 100 gig is just a you know, cost problem, just a financial problem, I think. So from my perspective, the price of 100 gig, uh, what vendors provide us uh, is getting down and down, like you said. And the current price is like for us, uh, what the 10 gig ethernet was like a couple of years ago. So it's almost same. Mm -hmm. So I know that, you know, the timing is really important, but uh, for uh, might be other ISPs, the timing might be the best right now, but for, you know, a different ISP or IXLs, the timing is not best right now. So, you know, it, it a little bit complicated issue, I think. Yes. Yeah. So the new generation chip or new chassis are coming. Uh, we knew it. <laughs> so, yeah, timing is a very uh, hard decision to make. But uh, if you wait tomorrow, then another new products are coming out. So, you know, if you have chance, don't lose it. Okay. So actually, I have one more question. Okay. Well, I think you guys have lots of like, experiences to deploy, you know, 100 gig, like you said. So uh, I'm, I'm wondering, do you have any comments about density of 100 gig Ethernet? Okay, but the density, um, like Sheepak was really small, and CFP2s are available now in the market, and I'm not quite sure with CFP4 or QSFP28. The density itself is getting smaller and smaller, but uh, like Curtis has been told me, but uh, the distance will be making really problem with that uh, density. But, you know, it's it's those chassis that are like Monsters chassis have a whole bunch of uh, interfaces, but we don't need that much. I mean, if that's uh, like a machine that can do everything, then it's fine. I, I, want, I would love to have that. That's a dream machine, but we still have to have distributed sites and stuff. So we would like to have something in the middle, and uh, which just, you know, uh, simple. I, I, I like speed and sim simplicity. So. <laughs> Yeah, simple is the best. So but you mean the current density is uh, it's too in, much? Uh, too much, okay. Gotcha. So do you have well, any? That, that's my, my opinion. Yeah, I, yeah. In the industry, it's a uh, it's monster, sorry. Yeah, it depends. So do you have any comments, questions? Nope. So if so, thank you so much, Takeji Lo-san. Thank you very much. And the last speaker is Sandra of IPV4 Market Group. Uh, she will be talking about the current IPV4 market situation. That's the limits of my technical ability. Here we go. Good morning. You're a lively group with lots of questions, so we'll see what we can do this morning. Uh, as was said, I'm Sandra Brown from IPV4 Market Group, and I'm going to talk this morning about the transfer market in Asia. Okay, four topics on the agenda. First, an introduction, and then I'm going to talk about the purchase process, which is how a company would go about acquiring IPV4 addresses. Then I'll speak to the year in review, 2014 in review, what happened in the APNIC region in terms of IPv4 transfers. And lastly, I'll close with some uh, outlook statements on 2015. So first of all, IPv4 address transfers. This is a pretty new market. It's very young. And it began back in 2011 with the famous now Nortel Microsoft transfer where uh, about, I think it was 9 slash 16s were transferred from Nortel to Microsoft. And the price at that time in that transaction was publicly known at $11.25 an IP. And as you'll see in some of my slides that follow, prices have fallen since that initial transfer. It, it's kind of like nobody knew what the price should be. 
and submissions were made. Nobody knew how many IPs would come to market and supply and demand wasn't known. So initial price was set at 11.25 and you're gonna see that prices has, have since fallen. In uh, the past year, we've seen that the RIPE NCC, and, and there's a couple of RIPE guys in the room today, the RIPE NCC is the most robust trading region. Uh, they do a pile of transfers every month compared to the other two regions, partly because Aaron hasn't run out of IPs yet where companies can go to Aaron and get free allocations. Uh, Aaron has about 0.3 slash eights available as of yesterday to give out. And uh, partly because the APNIC marketplace is, is a little bit slower in terms of companies requesting transfers. All the regions publish the transfer data. So all transfers are publicly viewable to see who's getting what IPs from what companies and in what volume. The only thing not visible is the price. So some of the pricing data I'm going to talk to today is based on my company's experience in the marketplace. And really the stuff we published is probably the only place uh, you're gonna hear and see about real market prices. So the second topic is the IPv4 purchase process. And there are some variations on this in terms of things like payment process, uh, in terms of some of the legal contract wording and so on. But this is pretty much a tried and true approach to purchasing IPv4 addresses. So the first part is really an engineering exercise within your company where someone defines how many IPs do I need? And you go to your finance people and you figure out, you know, what's my budget? How am I gonna do this internally from a finance and engineering perspective? Then you come to a broker such as us and you say, okay, I need these IPs, find me a seller that can satisfy my requirement. And that's what we do. We go out and we match the buyers and the sellers together to basically find a match. And once that's done, we bring the two parties under NDA, which is my third block along. So the non-disclosure agreement allows the transfer to be treated confidentially. Once everything is under a confidential arrangement, uh, the IPs are reviewed uh, both from an ownership legal perspective and then also from a technical perspective. Are the IPs clean? Are they blacklisted? Are they blocked at certain mailers? Those kinds of things have to be looked at because if they're blocked, frankly, they aren't worth very much to the buyer, are they? Next, we would do an asset purchase agreement, which is the legal contract between the buyer and the seller to define the purchase terms. The payment process varies region to region. Many Asia-based buyers want to buy using a net 30, net 15, net pay after the transfer approach. The norm in North America is an escrow process, and I, I'm gonna speak to escrow a little bit because I think what's gonna happen is as the supply in Asia region dries up, more and more Asian companies are going to need to purchase from America. And what's going to happen is when you buy from America, the American companies are not going to be accustomed to receiving payment after the transfer. And they're gonna to say to the Asian buyer, we need to pay by escrow. So we're going to have to find some common ground between this uh, desire and, and norm of paying after the transfer to the North American need to see an escrow payment. So that's something we're gonna to have to work on between the buyers and the sellers as we go into RIR. The, um, once the transfer is made, uh, which involves the uh, regional internet registries, so it can be through air into APNIC or it can be within APNIC only. Uh, if it's a transfer to a Japanese company, it would go from APNIC to JPNIC to the ultimate Japanese company. Uh, those are the kinds of gyrations you have in working through the NICs. Then once it's in the buyer's account, the buyer can uh, announce it on the internet and everything is good. If it is an escrow-based transaction, the funds that have been held in escrow are finally released to the seller. So in other words, the escrow protects the buyer and the seller both in the sense that the buyer knows he will get paid because the funds are on deposit. So if the transfer goes through, he gets paid. And the seller, sorry, the buyer is protected in the sense that the funds are on deposit. So if the transfer doesn't get, get through for some reason, and I've never seen it not get through, then the funds would have been released back to the buyer. So both parties are protected by an escrow arrangement. 
and the bill of sale uh, is the final step where the seller will give the buyer uh, an, an invoice that's marked paid and say, uh, you know, everything's done and good, and here's the amount you paid for your IPs. Just a few comments on the network engineering part of things, because I think we have some technically inclined people in the room. So, you know, what's your rule? Of course, you determine the number of IPs, and then you work with your finance on the budgetary part of the uh, equation. So if you're going to buy a slash 16 at $7 an IP, uh, you know, you're out there going, you know, 65,000 IPs times $7, you know, I'm going to need a good $440,000 to go make this transaction happen. And you've got to convince your finance guys this is the right thing to do. The costs of a transaction, other than the IPs are the major cost, the other things to consider really for the buyer are your ongoing APNIC membership fees. If you're a member of APNIC, you could be a member of JPNIC or uh, regional NICs in Indonesia, Malaysia, or wherever. And then also there is a transfer fee that APNIC applies. Again, if you're not a member of APNIC, then you pay your regional um, membership fee. So Indo Indonesia, for example, has a very minimal membership fee. The, the membership transfer fee for the transaction would be much less. So whatever applies to your case. There should not be, uh, in my opinion, the way we do business, any uh, fees charged to the buyer by the broker. In other words, the, the broker relationship is with the seller. The broker works for the seller selling the IPs. Uh, at the same time, the broker wants to have a good relationship with the buyer so that the buyer comes back to the seller, uh, to, sorry, to the buyer every time and has a good relationship. But really, um, it's the seller who should be paying the broker. You shouldn't be paying finder's fees in general. Um, sorry, I've got uh, a typo here. I've got right policy considerations, but it's really uh, APNIC policy considerations, a typo on my part. Um, the APNIC pre-approval, uh, as you may know, it's based on 80% need within two years. So there is a pre-approval process within the region. And just a few things, as I mentioned, you want to check for blacklisting. You want to make sure that the IPs have not been spammed on. Uh, and a good place to do this is senderbase.org. And some, some uh, sellers and buyers go so far as to allow for IP testing. So that's something you might want to consider where you can test a couple of slash 24s out of uh, the IP range that you're buying so you can make sure that they're clean and will meet your needs. We see this all the time. Uh, there is often a GOID location issue, uh, especially in a geographic area as large as Asia. So for example, if you have IPs transferred from Hong Kong as the seller to Singapore or Thailand or wherever as the buyer, it often takes up to two months for the geolocators to update. So what this means is you put the IPs uh, out to your users as soon as you get them, and they go into Google or whatever your uh, local uh, search engine is, and uh, the web pages that come up are web pages for, say, Hong Kong instead of immediately web pages for Thailand. It takes a couple months for that sort of thing to resolve. And the last thing you want to do in terms of verification is to check the AP NIC registry records against the seller records, the seller. Um, incorporation records to ensure that everything lines up and that you're not participating in something fraudulent. And certainly all of the RIRs help with this, APNIC uh, especially, make sure that the corporate records match the records in the uh, who is registry. Some negotiation points when you're dealing with a uh, arrangement between a buyer and a seller. So the price depends on the block size. What we see is the larger the block, the lower the price. So if you're buying a slash 20, you might see $13 an IP. And if you're buying a slash 16, you might see $7 an IP and anything in between. The payment method, as I mentioned, the norm in Asia is for payment net so many days, such as pay within 30 days. Uh, and the norm in North America is payment via escrow. Uh, and the norm in the UK, for example, is payment via a solicitor's account. So as these geographies come together, these payment methods are going to also have to come together, and it's going to be quite interesting. The legal venue for agreements. So th this is also interesting because as you have a buyer in one country and a seller in another, uh, you want to have a neutral ground. And often in uh, Asia, we see Singapore as the neutral ground choice because of its... Uh, jurisdiction as a, an international center for conflict resolution. 
So often uh, Singapore is chosen. And then there are often warranties in the agreement. Uh, a seller will want to put the IPs as is, and the buyer may request some warranties such as, uh, you know, the seller will warrant that the IPs are in the seller's name in the APNIC registry and those kinds of warranties. And last point is that the contract, as I said, between the buyer and the seller is called an asset purchase agreement. Just a little bit more on the escrow process. I, I've gone on this a, a little bit, so I don't want to dwell on it, but I think it's important to educate people on what the escrow process means because of the fact that it is a truly safe way to buy. It protects both the buyer and the seller, and it's something that the finance departments are going to have to get accustomed to. And, you know, as I said, it's, it's a, a good way to do it, and it's governed by an escrow agreement uh, so that it's legally binding. So some interesting statistics, and these are right out of the AP NIC uh, transfer uh, file, which is available online from an FTP site. So just looking, you can see the growth in transfers. And in 2014, we hit almost 4 million IPs transferred. So this is the number of IPs. And to look at the number of IPs per month, you can see it's not uh, consistent growth. It's kind of all over the map. The highest number of IPs was actually in February, and uh, October, November, December was actually a pretty light quarter for whatever reason. And then in terms of block sizes, you can see that the smaller blocks are the most common, uh, 76 slash 24s, 62 slash 23s, and 59 slash 22s. So the smaller blocks are often transferred, but the number of IPs, the sweet spot, the most IPs is in the slash 16 range where 1.5 million IPs were transferred. So that uh, has a lot to say in terms of where are the most IPs. And there was only one slash 13, one slash 14 uh, transfer in the region. Recent prices, I briefly mentioned uh, that the point is that the larger the block, the lower the price. And these are recent prices that my company has seen. And again, this is not really published anywhere. These slides are available online. So if you want to, uh, you know, see our data, we also publish it on our website uh, for other re regions. Uh, you'll find that ripe prices are a little higher than the prices in APNIC or ARIN. ARIN prices tend to be a little lower than APNIC. And the reason for that is that there's a quite a bit larger supply in ARIN region. At least that's my theory. And um, there's a very tight supply in AP NIC region, but I believe prices are uh, lower than ripe region because of the fact that you can transfer from Aaron right now. So that kind of keeps a cap on the prices here. The, uh, the prices, as I said, you, you start at uh, between seven and eight dollars for flash, slash 15s and 16s. And, and you can see that, that there's a fairly tight range of prices we observed over the course of, of uh, the year. Uh, when I said a slash 16 is $7, that's the price you can get it from, from uh, Aaron region. And it's a little more if you want to try to get one from within AP NIC region. There's not very many out there. I'm aware of uh, four or five slash 16s available in all of AP NIC region. So there's not very many. Versus in the US, there's slash eights out there where they're selling parts of their slash eights. So there's a huge supply in uh, Aaron region. Price trends, I talked briefly at the beginning about the Microsoft transaction, 11.25 per IP. And these are prices only in AP NIC region and the direction prices have gone. But you can see the general downward trend. The size of the ball represents the number of IPs traded. And you can see that the bigger clumps of IPs are kind of on the lower side of the line representing bigger blocks commanding lower prices, but you can still see the downward trend of the line, meaning that as time has gone on, uh, prices have dropped. My last topic is uh, the market outlook, what I think is gonna happen this year. And what we're seeing is, as I said, only four or five slash 16s in all of AP NIC region right now. So supply is very tight here, and that supply is going to be supplemented from Aaron region. Uh, someone will snap up those available blocks, but 
uh, at some point blocks are going to have to transfer from the other regions, especially here. And I think companies are going to be willing to pay a small premium, that $7 to $8 for these APNIC-based blocks. Two reasons. One is that a lot of the companies are going to want to pay net 30 instead of via escrow. And the second reason is the process of just dealing within your own region, things like the geo locator, things like only dealing with APNIC and not dealing with air, and those make the blocks a little bit more valuable. Last point is that I talked about the difference in prices, that right prices are a little higher than APNIC prices and Aaron being the lowest. Those prices aren't going to harmonize and may never harmonize um, because of different supply and demand curves in each region, but they aren't going to come closer together until this needs justification issue is common across all uh, regions. So today in ripe region, you don't have to do needs justification. In air and region, you have to prove need as in uh, APNIC, uh, two years, 80% utilization. And once that goes away in all regions or is common in all regions, that will change because companies don't want to do that if they don't have to. So until we get some uh, common ground amongst the regions, I don't think you'll see common prices. And that is my final slide, and I would be very pleased to take questions. I think this is just the last slide. Okay. So do you have any comments or questions to her? Okay. Um, even its Erin has a lot of space available, and I, I understand that the uh, I mean, from that your graph, the price is going lower. Even though it start exhausting, I thought is the price going to be higher instead of going lower. Is there a lot? There, uh, I mean, Airy has a whole bunch of addresses. That's why the. So the addresses that Aaron has available, Aaron itself has 0 0.31 slash eights available, and then um, the IANA will supplement that or is in the process of supplementing that with approximately a slash 11. So that's the supply that Aaron gives out to its members for free. In addition, the big supply in the Aaron region is what companies have that they got back in 1991, 1992, back when there was an Internet Activities Board prior to the existence of Aaron. So there are companies like Ford, General Electric, Halliburton Oil that have slash eights that they are only using a small part of, and those companies are doing company-to-company -company sales. And that's where the large supply is from these companies that no longer need or never did need the large gobs of IPs they got before the RIRs existed as a group, and that's why Aaron has the huge supply. It's Aaron region having the supply, not Aaron as an RIR having the supply. Thank you. Actually, that's what I was uh, going to ask. Sarah, I have the same question, and uh, I have one more question related to the question from him. So I might be missing something, but you mentioned earlier uh, as time goes by, the price of IBV4 is getting dropping, dropping. Is that correct? It has so far, but I have a belief that once Aaron as an RIR runs out of the 0 0.31 IPs plus the slash 11, once American companies start to join in the buying of the IPs, I think the price will start to increase whenever that happens. Uh, yeah, yeah. The other thing is that there's an uh, inter-RIR transfer policy that uh, the RIPE NCC is in the process of implementing, and we think that policy will be implemented in, in action sometime around June of this year. So if that's the case, with higher prices in the RIPE region, I think we'll see an increase in prices in uh, the U.S. pulled by the higher price in the RIPE region. So you'll see some increase, I believe, uh, perhaps in June from the influence of RIPE region, and then perhaps once the American companies that run out of whatever sandbagging they've done, um, you know, once the Americans come to the market and start buying, that will pull on the, the demand factor and I think prices will go up. 
but I think that's late this year, early next year before the sandbagging is over. Okay, so that sounds like so it's the best timing to get IP with your addresses. I, I think so. I really do. I think we're at an all-time low. Yeah, very good to know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So do you have any comments, questions? Nope. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sandra. Well, actually, this is the end of this session. So, Masataka san, Takejiro san, and Sandra, thank you so much for the great talk. So, please give them your warm hands. So, like I said, this is the end of this session. So, next session in this room is DNA.